Okay, traders, that's one o'clock British summertime, nearly the end of that. Um, if you can hear me loud and clear and you can see the tick mill welcome screen, if you could type a Y in the chat box and uh, we'll get this show on the road. So before we jump into today's content, as always, we want to adhere to the risk disclaimers. As we know, uh, trading any financial instrument carries an inherent amount of risk and it is possible to lose uh, more money than you necessarily have on deposit. And secondly, uh, most importantly for today, any views expressed here by me are solely mine and they are not indicative, <coughs> excuse me, or representative of uh, Tickmill UK or Tickmill Europe Limited. <clears throat> So, for those who are here for the first time, brief introduction to myself. Uh, like I say, my name is Patrick Munley. After I graduated from university, I joined a City PLC consulting firm in London. A couple of years there, learning the ropes, left with some colleagues, and went on to co-found and successfully exit a consulting startup post the merger in late 2004. I then moved on to explore my passion for markets with some chips to play with and some time on my hands. I started day trading, or more appropriately, day gambling the S&P 500. After some early beginner's luck, uh, I racked up some pretty solid gains and then some quite significant gains. However, as is often the case, the beginner's luck ran out and as the market phase started to change, I began to average down into losing positions, uh, giving back all my gains and then ultimately experiencing a significant six-figure personal hit to my capital. <clears throat> so this was a gut-wrenching and sobering experience is, uh, is an understatement at best. At this point, I had to stand back and figure out if it was feasible for me to make a living from the market. So I decided to get serious about trading and sort out a mentor with an excellent trading track record. Uh, working with the mentor for 18 months to two years ago was a period during which I upped not just my technical game, researching and developing a strategy that suited my personality. I extensively back and forward tested the strategy and developed a rigorous risk management approach to underpin the strategy. But more importantly, during this period of mentorship, I significantly developed my mental game. And probably the most important shift or watershed moment was where I moved from being a highly goal-orientated individual focused on financial gains to becoming purely process-orientated. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means I had to stop focusing on what I could make from the markets and start focusing solely on managing my mindset, which in turn will then allow me to consistently execute my trading strategy, often during periods of negative feedback from the markets in the form of losing trades or drawdowns. Once, you, once however, you become uh, process orientated and you have that uh, professional trading mindset, and you understand the true nature of trading being a, a numbers game in which you're simply playing the probabilities, you lose that emotional investment and that hellish emotional roller coaster of living and dying uh, by the outcome of individual trades. So I'm no longer concerned with the outcome of individual trades or even a small string of trades. My focus is on the next 100 trades because I know if I focus on excellence in execution, my edge will demonstrate itself over an extended series of outcomes. My multi-strategy approach has delivered profitable annual returns since 2008. Uh, since 2013, I've also been managing investor capital through a managed account service, delivering annual positive returns. I'm currently responsible for ma managing a multi-million dollar portfolio. Uh, since 2010, I've also personally mentored over 100 traders of all experience levels, from complete novices to former CME floor traders, in developing the technical and mental skills to reap consistent returns from the markets. I've consulted for uh, numerous brokers and trading education brands, uh, contributing written content, webinars, and live presentation content on a range of topics from market analysis to trading strategy development and execution. In addition to my fund management and mentoring, I'm also a resident market expert at uh, Tickmill, where I have an exclusive relationship with them to provide uh, a daily market outlook and a, and a trade of the day. Uh, you can access those directly from the Tickmill blog 
just by putting your email address in and, um, and that content will be delivered directly to your inbox. So you get a flavor of how it is I view the markets and how I, I work, uh, work with framing market data. Uh, the other, I guess, passion project for me is, uh, is as the head of trading and trader education for a leading trader education brand called fxcareerswap.com. At FX Career Swap, we're offering development and funding to retail trading talent. At FX Career Swap, we don't just develop retail traders' market and trading strategy knowledge. We work on mindset development and through a structured program that culminates in managing the firm's capital at zero personal financial risk on a profit share basis. For any of, uh, any of you who are interested in that, uh, you can see there's a number down there. You can call or you can email info at fxcareerswap.com. For, uh, for more information about that program. So that gives you a flavor of where I'm coming from. Before we jump into the actual technical charts, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the flow, sentiment, and seasonalities that I like to, to pay attention to um, when we're looking at the market. So, <coughs> excuse me, starting uh, as always with the uh, flow data and positioning data, as collated by um, Credit Agricole. You can see here that um, Euro positioning in terms of uh, longs are still stretched. We were not quite as high as we were a couple of weeks ago, but we're still stretched on the long side. So positioning firmly behind this Euro move at the moment. And then on the other end of the extreme, much like last week, we've got the Swedish Krona. And in between, you can see varying uh, levels of commitment to the commodity currencies, but the standout at the moment is really this, this Euro flow and also a significant pickup in sterling bids. And uh, for those who've been following uh, market narratives this week, obviously we have, uh, we have Boris Johnson backpedaling somewhat and deciding that uh, the, the talks will continue with, uh, with the EU counterparts and they're hoping now to pen a deal uh, sometime in mid-November. So that, uh, that move in sterling is, is also supported. Um, this is from uh, Credit Suisse. This is their, uh, the G10 Spot FX trading team. Um, these guys aren't the, the research uh, guys at Credit Suisse. These are the guys who are paid or are incentivized to provide insight to, to their trading clients, um, mainly um, hedge funds and institutions. And um, what's it, what I'm interested in here is the, uh, the US dollar note here, where um, much like everybody, they've been looking to sell the dollar on, on rally, uh, on rally, sorry. Um, but in, they're noticing the, the, the timing and the driver behind the current move uh, hasn't really been led by risk and, um, and the assumption of this democratic clean sweep in the US. So price action to, to their mind uh, looks like portfolio shifts or portfolio adjustments heading into the elections. Now, as we've seen, and we'll look in, on the chart shortly, we've seen some, uh, some pretty tight range trading in, uh, in spot FX. The volatility has come off. We're trading at very low levels of, vol of, of volatility at the moment. And that makes for this, this very choppy price action that we've witnessed in some, some pairs. But what we're heading into obviously is, uh, is these US elections. And um, as noted here, this is the uh, FX Crosswalk trading floor where I share updates and information with the, the trading team on a daily basis. Um, FX volatility, whilst low at the moment, is certainly starting to scale up as we head into the elections. And what you get here from this information is you get predicted scope of movement in and around the elections. So we're looking in terms of the, the dollar yen, anywhere from a 121 to a 95 pip range in terms of uh, the dollar yen pair. We certainly haven't seen much of that in recent trade. And similarly here in the Euro, we're looking at about 113 pips of movement in the Aussie, uh, 106 to 125. And then in sterling, we're looking anywhere from 230 to 213. So what you're getting a sense of here is that as we head into the elections on November the 3rd, we can expect a significant increase in volatility. And as such, you need to think about that in terms of your position sizing, um, trading in and around the elections if you're, uh, if you're, if you're inclined to, or your, your strategy or plan allows you to do that. You certainly want to be thinking in terms of an expansion in range. This volatility crush that we've experienced of recent, of, of, in recent weeks will explode. And, um, and this information is, is certainly <coughs> underpinning that. 
Now I want to uh, take a look at some seasonal factors to consider in terms of the dollar index and specifically in and around uh, the presidential elections. So the dollar has a tendency to strengthen 100 days after the presidential election. Um, what we've got here is a, <coughs> it's a fractal pattern. So an, an average uh, of um, the election uh, price action, and this is in the dollar index, 100 days before and 300 days after the presidential election. So we can get a sense here that the dollar has, a, has the potential to either <coughs> put in a low in and around the election or very shortly after that, and then we should see a period during which um, there should be some, some dollar strength in the market. Now, what I've got here is a seasonal chart. This shows the dollar index over the past 49 years, and I've specifically checked the, the election period. So what, we, what we've got here again is an aggregated average. Now, it's interesting to note that this average is almost the inverse of this pattern. And certainly if we think about the, the price action we're seeing in the dollar at the moment, we're actually seeing the inverse of this dollar strength. What we've been witnessing is dollar weakness. So if we think in terms of inversion of this cycle, so instead of actually seeing a high into the elections, we actually have the potential to see a low into the elections or just past the elections in terms of the dollar. So this is a pattern that <clears throat> whilst, I, whilst you, I'm never going to necessarily trade this information per se, certainly I'm going to be paying attention to price action in the dollar, cognizant of the fact that we could see a dollar low come into play in and around these elections or just after them. Similarly, here we have the euro dollar. Now, the euro dollar pattern actually appears um, to, to suggest that we get a high in the euro dollar. So again, a high in the euro dollar with a low in the dollar index, because obviously they're trading inversely. So this would suggest that into the, in or around the election, we actually see a high in the high in the euro dollar, a low in the dollar. Let's take a look now at sterling. Similar story here, <coughs> although in terms of sterling, that high tends to come in a little bit later in terms of mid to uh, mid to late November. And that, were, again, if we think in terms of uh, the Brexit news that we're all expecting now, is the idea that we're going to get a Brexit deal, or, the, or certainly that the, um, the way it's being positioned to the market at the moment is that, uh, that the both, both parties to the negotiations feel there should be a, a deal come mid-November. And you can see how that would, uh, that would pretty much nicely tie in with a, a high in terms of sterling as well. And that the, the, the mechanism for that is that obviously um, the market or, or market participants, or should I say savvy market participants, have a tendency to buy the rumor or sell the rumor. And if you buy the rumor, they sell the facts. Or if you sell the rumor, you buy the facts. So what does that mean in terms of trading? Well, it means at the moment, the market <coughs> is anticipating we're going to get a deal and is bidding up sterling. And what generally tends to happen then is that when we get that deal and it's announced that the market will sell into that good news. So this, again, syncs up with this idea that we see a peak in terms of sterling heading into uh, mid-November. Dollar-Yen, we're looking at, again, you've got to think in terms of the dollar-Yen as an inversion versus this, this track. So what we're looking for here in the dollar-Yen is a tradable low. In a minute, I'm going to, we're going to look at the dollar-Yen chart in a bit more detail as there's an interesting pattern developing there from a trading perspective. But <coughs> again, thinking in terms of the dollar-Yen as an inversion, similar to the dollar index. We're looking for the dollar yen to make a low, dollar index to make a low, or potentially make a low. And we have gold here. <coughs> what it's suggesting at the moment is that gold would make a low and trade, uh, trade moderately higher. Now, if we get a contested election, i.e. that we don't get a clear winner um, come November the 3rd or November the 4th, sorry, um, then gold could actually, could actually catch a safe haven bid as people look to, uh, to move out of risk assets. So this idea um, that we could see some strength in gold combined with strength in the dollar, uh, whilst that confounds many less experienced traders because they're of the belief that if the dollar's going up, then gold has to go down. That isn't necessarily the case. And certainly if you look at flows of recent periods, there are 
numerous account, numerous examples of where the dollar and gold have moved in the same location as safe haven instruments. So we could see this, we could see a pop in terms of gold if the election is contested. If it isn't contested and we get a clean sweep in terms of um, a Biden win, then, uh, then we may see a different story in terms of gold. Um, copper is, uh, it's co copper again. If we think in terms of copper as driving the commodity currencies, and, um, and again, we're looking at an inversion here. So we're looking for copper to potentially make a peak now into the election. And again, we'll take a look at the copper chart in a minute, trading charts, and uh, there's an interesting pattern developing on copper. Uh, what have I got here? Last but not least, crude oil. So this pattern would suggest that crude obviously strengthens into the election. I'm gonna show you a, a technical setup in a minute that means we could see some weakness into the election. Obviously, crude oil <laughs> does have a tendency to trade inversely to the dollar because of crude being priced in dollars. Um, and last but not least, just in terms of positioning of the dollar index, we have seen a short covering in terms of that, uh, those shorts in, uh, in positioning in the, in the dollar index. So that's, that's just some um, sentiment, flow, seasonality information that you just want to, to, to bear in mind as we head into, into what's likely to be a, a volatile period. Um, first chart, oh, this is the Bitcoin chart. So uh, from a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Bitcoin volatility and um, we identified a, a, a statistical setup here that suggested we'd see some strength in Bitcoin. And um, <laughs> we were looking for a break of this Sending trend line, we've got that. And the, the initial target we had, or we were looking at was 13,000. We, uh, we pinged that yesterday. So what I've now been looking for is some potential bullish consolidation here, and ultimately a move up to the top side of the channel now at, uh, at 14,000. And then from there, <coughs> excuse me, we, um, we could see a pullback back to test. Oh, one second, coming up wrong. So from, from current levels, we get the move up into the top side of the channel. And then from there, you can see a, a corrective pattern develop, three wave move um, before looking for a base somewhere around these prior highs here at, uh, at 12,500 for a potential new leg um, to the upside they play out. So, um, so that's certainly one to, uh, that I've got on my radar at the, um, at the moment. Let's just change those colors, that's better. Um, so that's Bitcoin. So let's start with the dollar index. As always, I've, I've flagged a few charts here I want to look at. Um, dollar index, let's just get rid of um, this for a second so we can see the colored candles. So the dollar index, we were tracking this five-wave pattern. Um, there was the potential last week when we saw this, these bullish reversals that we could make a, a move to test this um, 9560 area Did, didn't get any follow through. We saw resistance again at, um, at the trend line. And so what we've got now is a potential pivot here with um, as long as we hold below 9392, we look for a test of 9216, which is an equality move versus, um, let's just draw this in. So it's an equality move versus this swing here. And, uh, and we look for a test of the equality move. Now, it's interesting where that would put us in terms of these prior lows here and the potential for a double bottom heading into um, the back end of, of November and those elections. And then if we're thinking in terms of the potential for some strength, then uh, we could see the dollar make a, an attempt at that, uh, at that 96 area that, um, that we've been looking at. Now, conversely, if we get rid of this, and remove that. We could be in uh, in the process of trying to at least hold this area, which I'd uh, which I'd highlighted before. And um, and if we did hold here, then thinking about the equality move to the upside, so we could still see a run into this um, this ninety five fifty area if we hold these levels. Obviously at the moment, the balance of probability suggests that we're gonna see some a bit more downside here and, um, and the dollar does look to be under pressure. And certainly if, um, if the US uh, Congress and uh, Senate can cobble together some type of fiscal stimulus deal, that's probably gonna weigh on the dollar. So at the moment, whilst we trade below 93, uh, 92, then we're looking for this 92.16 area to, uh, to test through there. Then we're looking down towards the, the 90 handle on the downside for this fifth wave to complete. 
and, um, and what we ideally would like to see that obviously into the elections here and then the potential um, for a dollar low or a tradable correction at least in the dollar is, uh, is what we'll be watching. Similar story, so that's the broad dollar index versus um, six other currencies. What we've got here now is the um, equal weighted dollar index and, um, and we're holding this support area uh, similar to the dollar but we've got a lot of work to do. In terms of my, my trading strategies and my approach to the markets, what I'm looking for to give me a signal in terms of strength, and it's easier to see if I just bring this back, is that for me to get a, a signal on the long side here, I would need this candle to close back above the near term volume waste average price, which is a five period volume waste average price. And you can see we would, uh, we'd have to get back up above really towards the weekly pivot for that to, to play out. So whilst it's not impossible, bounce probabilities at this moment with the way the momentum studies are orientated, uh, suggest we, we're probably gonna leap to the downside here. Swiss is in an interesting position. Um, it's looking now like we could get a test of this descending trend line support here. So whilst we hold um, the 91.67, look for 89.50 to get a test. And, um, and from there, we could, uh, we could consider that we might stage some type of uh, three-wave corrective recovery in terms of the Swissy. But uh, this is going to be the key area, 89.50, this descending trendline support. The Swiss National Bank are not going to be keen to, uh, for this to be trading meaningfully below 90. So keep an eye on that. Could see some interesting volatility in terms of the Swissy. Dolly Yen, we just talked, I uh, just referenced, Dolly N is actually sitting on its trend line support now. And, um, and we're just through the equality objective here and we're, we're trying, to, uh, trying to stage a bit of a recovery here. Um, again, it's got work to do in terms of giving me a signal today. We need to trade back through 105.17, uh, but we'll have to see where we close. Like I, like I say, it's all really about the closes with um, my strategy um, in terms of signals and triggers. So if we can get a close back up towards this 105.15 or through it even, that would be a bullish um, signal for me. And that would set up a move to, uh, to test the downside sending trend line resistance back towards the 106.50 and, um, and the equality objective there. So we're tracking this pattern into there. Euro. So we uh, broke out of the sending trend line resistance. So we had uh, this here, took that through the highs. We came just shy of the equality objective. So we were looking for a test just above 119. And, um, and we've stalled out at the moment. But if we can get into this 119 area, I'll certainly pay attention to, to price action there because there is still the potential there that we, um, that we complete this quality objective and then correct lower um, again in a uh, in what some people refer to as a double zigzag type pattern um, before moving higher there in terms of the euro. So really I'm watching to see how we respond just above 119 as a, uh, as a potential bull trap. Uh, we also have the 78.6% retracement there as well. This is a nice technical pattern Fibonacci uh, set up into this just above one, 119. So keep an eye on that. Euro yen, nothing for me to do there. Now Sterling Swiss, I've got an order in here. I'm looking to, uh, to go long Sterling Swiss through the overnight highs and, um, and the setup I'm looking for there now is that we have completed this structure here. And this sets us a quality objective. Let's get rid of that one. Uh, just about the 12090 area. And again, if we think in terms of the uh, Fibonacci patterns here, get that 78.6% retracement. So ultimately what I'm looking for with this is that we, um, we continue to consolidate, bullish consolidation, and ultimately move up to this 120.90 area, 
where I'll uh, where I'll reassess. Now, beauty of this pattern, where you get these inside um, candles like this after a, a big range expansion, is you can really uh, get some excellent risk reward parameters in terms of stops. So you can get your stop up just below the overnight lows, and um, and that gives you the the risk reward uh, much more attractive than having to risk the candle here and uh, and setting yourself up for. Uh, you know, to make new highs almost. So um, again, always thinking in terms of risk rewards with, with the setups, you know, the, the chart pattern can look uh, look like a Picasso, but unless the risk reward's right and it's tight, then, uh, then it's going to be a pass in terms of a, a business opportunity, so to speak. And that's what we're all in, uh, in trading for is business to make money. So that's an important concept to pay attention to. Um, Sterling has run into <coughs> the top side of this, this little channel it's been trading in. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some consolidation here in, in sterling um, as we wait now for this uh, for this next round of, of brexit negotiations to commence sterling yen i also like sterling yen as well um, let's remove these so the sterling yen has a similar pattern and if if we think it has a potential for the dollar yen to uh to maybe make a low here we could get a double driver on this and um and what we'd look for is So we've got a nice target area there. So from this current level, we look for a move up into that 140. And again, thinking in terms of risk reward, if we're looking at putting this trade on, we want to see the, the highs get taken there. And then we can get that nice tight risk reward and make that work in terms of at least a two to one uh, risk reward ratio there with Sterling in. So that's one I'm also eyeing. I think we do in the Aussie at the moment. The Aussie Kiwi is sitting right at uh, the projected trend line support. So keep an eye on this one. We might get some, might get a correction here in terms of the Aussie Kiwi and get a retest of this trend line support from below. Um, but certainly, uh, any move into here, you would anticipate uh, find some resistance and we potentially get another move down to get a third test of the trend line before a more um, meaningful correction may ensue. Uh, Kiwi is, head, is Kiwi's just uh, come into that head and shoulders area again. And again, if you think in terms of what I was saying about ranges, I mean, the Kiwi basically uh, for the past, uh, well, for October essentially has traded, uh, a, you know, just shy of a, just over a hundred pip range the whole, uh, whole of the month. So this is indicative of heading into a, you know, a, 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 a significant market event as, uh, as with these US elections. No one's going to, to get over positioned or extend themselves uh, too much ahead of that. But uh, certainly pay attention to how we trade here. If we can get up through this head and shoulders, then, um, then that would be a very bullish development to my mind. And we could be looking at, uh, at meaningfully higher prices, certainly up to this 70 level in terms of the Kiwi. Kiwi yen. We've got a little uh, little trend line support here that it's holding. And we've got this descending trend line. So I'd look for a bullish, I don't want to see a range expansion candle here that takes out this monthly pivot to, uh, to get excited on the long side in terms of the Kiwi yen. Nothing in the Kiwi Swiss, but I, I like this, uh, this Kiwi CAD is a trade I'm in at the moment. Um, I shared it through the uh, Tickmill blog. And, and again, thinking just in terms of basic risk reward, you get this big range expansion. Um, we have held the uh, equality objective. So we have this swing here versus this swing. And you can see we've pretty much held that to the pip. Um, we also have, I don't have it on these charts, but we have a weekly and monthly projected range support here. And, um, and again, just thinking in terms of risk reward, we, uh, we play the break of the overnight high, we get a stop just in below the, the weekly pivot there on this one. And again, you know, to get the two to one risk rewards, we, uh, we really don't have to do too much work on the upside. Uh, interestingly on that one, it coincides with the uh, descending trend line resistance here. So we can squeeze a bit more out of that potentially. Um, let's get rid of that for a second. So we could be looking up there. In terms of uh, measuring 
looking for potential swing scope. We have this one here. So we can easily, or we can reasonably expect to test of this 8830 versus the last major swing to the upside, having taken out these now. And, um, and again, just thinking always in terms of risk reward, making sure that that risk reward stacks up and making it, making your targets achievable, um, you know, versus putting on the trade here and thinking, right, we'll be up here next week and, uh, and everything's roses. You've got to really be thinking in terms of what, what you can reasonably expect out of the market versus recent price action is, uh, is a way of managing your, your expectations. Um, I'm just going to finish up here uh, with copper because I talked about this. So copper had, uh, has been in this ascending trend line, uh, it's ascending trend channel support has been really driving uh, the momentum that we'd seen in uh, commodity FX. And now we are up here, uh, retesting the trend line, um, the trend channel from below where we're, we're having a, an issue at the moment, we're certainly stalling out. And we've also got this um, prior ascending trend line projected. So we've got the intersection of these two trend lines. We're trading at the volatility resistance bands and we've got considerable divergence in terms of our momentum studies. So watching copper now, because if we take out uh, 313 here on the downside, then, um, then I could see in relatively short order that, um, that we trade down to 290 at least to test the, um, the ascending trend line support again. And maybe this, looking at this, um, this momentum here, this momentum exhaustion, we might have more work to do on the downside in terms of copper to correct all of this and let it unwind before we try and build, uh, build another leg to the upside. So keep an eye on copper. Um, we could be seeing a uh, start here of a more pronounced correction, uh, certainly, and get a bearish close uh, today, take out yesterday's lows and close at the lows of this candle. And I like, uh, I like copper to trade lower into, uh, into the elections as we talked about with the, with the slides at the beginning. So those are, uh, those are some of the trades I'm in, some of the trades I'm watching and, um, and some of the patterns that I think are in play as we head into what is going to be a pivotal period in the markets. So are there any questions? If you, uh, if you want me to take a look at a pair I haven't covered, you can type it into the chat and I'll, uh, I'll take a look and see, uh, see what, we're, what we're looking at. Or alternatively, you can unmute your microphone and, uh, and you can speak to me via the audio. Equally, if there aren't any questions, an N in the chat box is just as helpful. Uh, s and so the S&P, I'm looking for uh, the S&P to test this ascending trend line support, the monthly pivot from above. And, um, and from there, I think we could then get the, um, we could then make a, a, a retest these prior highs and potentially take them out as, uh, again, that is gonna be really dependent upon, um, upon them at least announcing that, uh, that they've got a deal here. But what I've been looking for is, um, is you know, we get in here and then deal announced and we uh, and we trade up into the actual level I'm looking at is 3720 or 3740 and then from there I think we could um, we could get a pullback a more meaningful pullback should I say uh cad yen yeah I mean so uh you know this looks uh, you know, that's a bit, that's a, uh, one second, I've lost my, there we go. So, I mean, it's, it, it looks bearish. The only thing we've got here is the, the psych indicator is still bullish. Um, and we've potentially got the dollar yen trading at uh, what could be pretty pivotal support. So for the CAD yen to really roll over here, you'd want to see the dollar yen trading below this, this trend line. Does that make sense? So these yens are basically, being propped up at the moment by this, this pattern here. Any other questions? If there aren't, an N in the chat box and I'll know that we're all, uh, we're all on the same page and uh, we'll wrap this one up here. Okay, thanks very much everyone for your time and I hope you found this content useful and uh, we'll reconvene same time next week. Thanks very much.